Are you tired of books that just have the old traditional farm boy in medieval Europe and he's just going to go on an adventure now? Uh, well, I have got the book for you. Life is nothing more than moments in time. To achieve greatness, you have to give up those moments. You have to give your life to the goal. For the days without difficulty are the days you do not improve. I'd rather live with a thing done poorly than do nothing and always wonder how things could have been. For I cannot imagine a world where the man holding a sword does not have the last say over the man without one. He was not the strongest, the quickest, or the most talented, not by any measure. He knew this and he knew he could not control this. However, he could control his effort, the work he put in, and there he would not be beaten. What's up, bookworms? Mike back again to talk a little Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. This is a video that actually has been delayed a little bit because we did a read-along on the channel, and uh, that's fine if you didn't, if you missed that. There's always time to go back to those videos. They aren't going anywhere. But yeah, they're very spoileries. I had a lot of requests for uh, a non-spoiler review of this book, obviously, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to actually talk about it because this is a book I feel like a lot of people should read. I'm going to talk about why. Uh, as for the delay in the review, look, while the channel is still... You know, very low on the booktube totem pole. Uh, it is growing rather quickly, enough so that I'm getting a lot of viewers from more popular booktube channels. And I just kind of want to set the record straight that uh, the morning that I was planning to record this video, uh, Murphy Napier did a review. And I already get accused, guys, of just copying Murphy and Daniel's reviews. Uh, look, those guys, they, they do their books, they do their channel as their full-time job. This is just a side thing, a hobby for me. I don't actually do this for income or anything like that. So those guys are going to push out a lot more content than I do. So yeah, chances are if I've read it, they've already read it and they've already reviewed it. So uh, I don't go through and copy anyone's channel, but I also don't want to release a video on the exact same day as one of those channels because like I said, I already uh, get that complaint quite a bit. But I can assure you, uh, I am fans of those guys' channels and, I, and I, while I do watch your stuff, I, I definitely for my own opinions and I have my own schedule but I don't like to drop stuff on the exact same day because uh, there's gonna be that inevitable comparison there but that aside let's talk about uh, the rage of dragons now the format that I'm gonna do here is what I've started doing is I'm gonna tell you what it's about what makes it good or not so great and then why you should read it that are the three things won't be doing spoilers this video obviously because I have uh, a full spoiler section for that but I'll talk about that at the end so let's get into it guys what is this book a about. Um, if you read the blurb on the back of the book here, it says uh, the same old tired cliche of it's Game of Thrones meets blank. Uh, for this one, it's Game of Thrones meets Gladiator. Um, I understand why they do this. Game of Thrones is obviously the hot name, especially when this book came out about a year, not a year ago. I can't even remember that last, last summer. But uh, at the time, before that last season of Game of Thrones kind of like tainted people's opinion on it, which is stupid. It's still a fantastic show. It just, you know, it didn't stick to landing. It happens. Anyhow, I don't want to derail this by talking about Game of Thrones. But I feel like everyone's still using that, especially with fantasy readers who try to get in the new audiences that are really, really excited about Game of Thrones. And so it's Game of Thrones meets blank. Um, obviously, I feel like this is done with everything now, but I don't feel like it's the case in here. I feel like the Gladiator, that part actually kind of does fit. I saw a lot of Gladiator in this. So the, that comparison is good, but I'd have to say it's more Gladiator meets Pierce Brown's Red Rising, which if you guys are, you know, constant viewers of this channel, you know I'm a very big fan of Red Rising. So that's the comparison, actually, that got me to read this book. Uh, but uh, let's just get into kind of what's about it. Have, you have this group of people called the Omehi. And if I say any of these names wrong, I apologize. I didn't listen to the audiobook. I'm just going off of what I read it as. So the Omehi, they've uh, been locked in this uh, land war with this other clan known as the Hadini. And they are, they're vastly outnumbered by the Hadini, but they possess what is known as the gifted on their side, which are, in simple terms, 
people that are capable of like doing magic basically they are able to grant a lot of op abilities to their warriors in battle and that's as non-spoilerly as i can go with it there but uh but the biggest power is their ability to work together and call upon these dragons that they call guardians if needed and that then you have the name spoiler guys there are dragons in the book so i don't feel like that's too much of a spoiler but uh <laughs> yeah there you go uh, but the story centers on Tao. He is a low commoner, and he uh, he deals with tragedy, banishment, finding a reason to live, and focusing on revenge, kind of as that re remedy. Now I know that's nothing that's nothing new. A lot of books focus on, on things like that. A lot of fantasy books. But let me just just wait. Don't 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 abandon ship yet. There's a, a lot of this book. It kind of focuses focuses on this competition that uh, will give Tao an opportunity to achieve his goals and his revenge in a fair and rational way than just a straight up revenge tour uh, I'm coming to get you kind of thing it, it, it actually makes a lot of sense and I know people hear competition and they think oh Hunger Games no not Hunger Games not at all Red Rising was more Hunger Games than this and I'm going to bring up Red Rising a lot in this and that's a good thing guys I love the Red Rising series so just hang on hang on here now, along the way, there is a bigger conspiracy, obviously, that's going to be uncovered, and Tao has to decide, you know, between revenge and doing what's right. You know, it sounds cliche, doesn't it? Trust me, it is, but it isn't. I'm just trying not to give away too much here. But let's talk about what makes it good or not makes it so, or what makes it good and what makes it maybe not so great. Uh, for me, it's very good, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, first up, there is the training sequences. In most books like these, I hate the training sequences. I feel like they're necessary, but I would rather just have a quick montage of, you know, hey, cool, they, they, they trained again. One of the biggest things, I think back to something like Aragon, where you have this story, this very light story wrapped around the book being 85% sword training. And again, while it's believable, I don't need to hear about it. I don't need to hear about everything. I don't need the midi-chlorian explanation of how they got good with a sword. But in this, man, I feel like... Uh, it's, it's done in a way to where I never really get ex tired of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's cliched as hell. And the training sequences are, can sometimes seem tiring and repetitive. But, man, seeing Tao's growth happen in this just organically. And it's not just like overnight he's all of a sudden badass with a sword. Now, it's a joy to read. It really is. It really, really is. And, I mean, there's no Gary Stu stuff here. He struggles. He struggles. He goes through trials and tribulations. And that's what I require out of a protagonist not to... To hit that that uh, Gary Stu tag that I hate so much. Uh, another thing I really loved is the action. Uh, this is where I really see the comparisons to Pierce Brown quite a bit because while I love the Red Rising series, um, and that's again why I went to this book was based off those comparisons. I, I definitely see them. I call this the fantasy equivalent to it. Although you know it's not as grim dark as Red Rising. But you got to remember that Red Rising didn't start off grimdark. It grew to that. And I think that this is going to do that as well. And that's a good thing. But I mean, the action is just fast, fast paced. It's chaotic. There's times where you don't know what's going on. But in a way that like, what is this guy writing about? A way that war is nuts. It's crazy. And sometimes you can lose focus on what's going on. I think that that's really a talent that Pierce Brown and like Joe Abercrombie has where you can just see that war is hell and it is never organized and sometimes you're going to be you know confused on what's going on and it but again it's done in a way where it's not just like what am I reading here it's like holy shit what is going on uh, so yeah you'll be flipping those pages so fast that this book is over before you realize it then you have the secondary characters this is where the gladiator comparison kind of resonated with me because seeing uh, the relationships developed between Tao and the other in, uh, in Jayed's Five, uh, the development was, it's very reminiscent of Maximus in Gladiator with his, the, other, the other prisoners, the other slaves. And uh, I, I really, I actually truly cared about the secondary characters. A lot of times in books like these, you know, they just feel like fodder or carbon copies, you know, Avatar 1, Avatar 2 kind of thing. Uh, no, they each have distinct personalities. And they each have a reason for being there. They they each serve a purpose more than just uh, we need a red shirt or you know we need we need the comic relief. No, it's it's not like that at all. I really feel like he developed them in a way that uh, I want to actually know more about these secondary characters in following books. And that's uh, that's that's just shows it's very well done. It's very well thought out. It's not just you know okay I gotta have this character here. I gotta have this type of character. He's not checking boxes at all. They all matter. They're all important. Um, some of the not so good things I want to talk about is that I feel like the romance was not so great. Uh, I've said before, I've, I've gotten the reputation as someone who doesn't like romance or politics in my books. It's not true at all. I, I just don't like bad romance and I don't like political allegory. Uh, I feel like 
this romance, while I feel like the character of Zuri is good, she's a very good character. Again, I don't have any characters in this book that I really just adamantly dislike, as in like, I don't want to read them. I mean, I have characters I dislike because they're pieces of garbage, yes, <laughs> but I mean, that's in a good way. But the romance subplot in this is just incredibly forced, and it seems to be cute here because it has to be. It didn't feel earned. It never really connected with me. And the sex scene is one of the most cringiest things I've ever read. Fantasy authors, stop trying to write sex scenes. It is not your forte. Uh, re watch my, uh, <laughs> if you're really bored, watch my reading of the Harlequin romance novels to see where I talk a little bit more about fantasy authors doing this. But uh, another thing is there is a lot of traditional fantasy tropes in here. You'll see lots of things you've seen a few hundred times before. I think they're done in a really fresh way. Again, I don't have problems with traditional fantasy tropes as long as you don't act like you're reinventing the wheel. If you act like this is something that you came up with and you just that's just ridiculous. But you can still do f traditional fantasy tropes of the chosen one or something like that. I'm fine with that as long as you don't act like it's something special. Uh, I feel like this is done in such a fresh way that uh, you know. You might, you might be a little bothered by it than I was. I really wasn't, but there are a couple of things where I can see people kind of detracting from that, and I have seen that in some of the criticism. For me, it, it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. I'm fine with, with traditional tropes, uh, like I said, as long as they seem somewhat fresh. And I feel like he puts a fresh enough kind of spin on it that it doesn't take away from it. And lastly, the ending is basically just an advertisement for book two. Uh, I'm fine if he, this is book one of what, three? I think some people said it was going to be four. But if he has a planned beginning, middle, and end, perfectly fine with the way this book ends. Unfortunately, there's only one book out, so I can't really say. So time will tell on that one. Uh, but I want this to know that he has a beginning, middle, and end planned in advance. And this isn't going to be a, oh, well, you know, the series is popular now, so I'm gonna, now I'm going to Brent Weeks it like he did with Lightbringer. I like Brent Weeks, but... Lightbringer just made me so upset. Anyhow, uh, so yeah, that's the only way I have a problem with it. But uh, again, time's going to tell on that one. So, uh, you know, this was an independent author who got this published later by Orbit. So uh, I'm hoping, I, I understand that it's like, okay, I have an unexpected hit, so I'm going to make this longer than I originally planned. I really hope that ain't it, because that's when you just start getting into books of filler. And I really don't want that to be this. So if he has a beginning, middle, and end, again, I'm fine with the ending. Uh, lastly, the lingo. I know that the lingo, the terminology, the names will likely confuse the hell out of you at first. Um, I read it off the digital book. I got the actual physical book later, but it actually has like a glossary of terms and like a, uh, I guess like a, a, a cast system listing that'll actually make it a little more clear for you. If you don't have that, it might be a little confusing at first. Uh, and it can uh, kind of, at times, it'll start to devolve into word salad a bit. But I uh, just trust me that the important words will stick. And you'll get them. Uh, there are plenty of words that, like I said, again, Red Rising through a lot of terms out there that's like that were never explained. It's just like this is how things are now. This is just everyday talk, and you just have to accept that. Have a lot of the same thing here, but uh, it might bother you a little bit. Uh, I, I was kind of annoyed by it a couple of times, not gonna lie, but I don't feel like it ruins the book. And just trust me, like I said, you'll get it. And lastly, why should you read it? Well, man, if you like uh, page turners, this is for you. Um, if you like Red Rising, I definitely think that this will be a series for you. And much like Red Rising, I think Winter has found a way to make his book nonstop action. You know, even something as simple as training seems like it has stakes and you care about what's going to happen. You find yourself rooting for the protagonist. You find yourself despising the antagonist. And again, I know that Paige Turner gets thrown out there way too liberally these days. I think this is one of those cases because, you know, I was doing the raid along where it was like, you know, a hundred pages or, or more, a little more, a little less per week for the read-along because I know that not everybody's a super fast reader. And there were people in that read-along that were like, I couldn't stop. I finished the whole damn book. So uh, I definitely think that this is very much earns the page turner label. Uh, uh, again, while it has the fancy tropes, I, again, I, I don't want to just kind of go on and on about it, but I feel like it, it feels fresh by taking the story outside of your usual traditional medieval Europe and into like ancient tribal Africa. It's such a fresh take and I love it. And I feel like that's something that isn't done enough. Taking everything out of, you know, swords and shields of Europe. I, it really, really felt fresh to me. And I know that's why a lot of people liked it. I also like that there's no 200 pages of world building. I feel like this is something that gets thrown out so much now. If someone doesn't like what, how much descript, how, how overly long and overly descriptive a book is, people say, oh, well, you just don't like it. It's just world building. 
World building still needs to be interesting, in my opinion. No one wants to feel like they are in history class. You know, there's some short info dumps done here through character uh, interaction, but never to the point where I feel like I should be taking notes because this is school. I never feel like that. And uh, I feel like they're, they're paced around enough. There is no just long chapter of dumps. And that helps quite a bit. He does do some world building here, but it's very light and very approachable to a way that's not going to bog down the reader like some other books that I won't mention because that gets me in trouble usually. Uh, but again, guys, this is just this is one of the better fantasy debut novels I've read. I keep comparing it to Red Rising. And again, that is a compliment of the highest order for me because that is one of my favorite series. But this first book is better than Red Rising book one was. So I hope it follows that same trend where I feel like the books just get better and better. Uh, it shows a ton of promise. I've already pre-ordered book two. Uh, I think if you read it, you're going to do the same. It comes out. It was coming out this summer, but I think they've moved it back to the fall, which seems weird because that's a uh, you know Brandon Sanderson time. Uh, it feels weird to kind of move your book towards that. But again, again, I don't know. I don't know. I gave the book four out of five stars, which if you watch my most recent uh, video about my rating system, is about as high of a rec high of a recommendation as you can get from me. Uh, I don't give very many books five stars, but I don't want to get into that whole rabbit hole right now. But uh, yes, very, very, very good. Highest of recommends. Check it out. It's very fresh while still using some of the traditional fantasy tropes that you're used to. But I keep using the word fresh, and that's what I would explain this book as, a fresh take on this genre that is very, very sorely needed. So uh, excellent debut by a, by, a, by a very young author, and I can't wait to see what he does next. I'm not doing spoiler talk at the end of this, like my format has changed too, because I did those in a separate set of videos when I was hosting that read-along. But I have decided to condense those videos into one long spoiler video, uh, taking out all the rambling parts at the beginning, because you know I love to ramble, right guys? Uh, if, so that's good for you if you want just uh, full spoilers, but just know that there is no new content in that video. So if you've already watched those, you're not going to get anything new out of it. It's just a clip show. And I won't do that very often. I just thought it was better than repeating the spoilers again from that. But just know that there are big moments in this book that matter quite a bit. There are surprises, there's twists and turns, and I think you're going to love it. So uh, guys, if you've read it, drop in the comments, let me know what you think about it. If you, you want to read it, hey, drop in the comments, let me know. Uh, let's save this spoiler talk for the spoiler video. But uh, hit me in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there.